Welcome to the Missions Podcast, the show that explores your hard questions of missions, theology, and practice to help goers think and thinkers go. I'm Alex Copeland, Director of Advancement and Communications with ABWE, with Scott Dunford here, Pastor of Redeemer Church in Fremont, California, and we have Paul Davis, President of ABWE, and Jason Allen, President of Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. Thank you for joining us, both of you. Delighted to be here. Yeah, we're really glad to have you. We're grateful for our friendship with Charles Smith, who's a part of ABWE as well, and we've had him on the show multiple times, and it's good to have you on. I think the last time we spoke was in an elevator four years ago at the last T4G at the Galt House, which I'm sure made a huge impression I'll on you. So yeah, you got a better memory than I did. I, I don't it's, recall I'm that I'm sure you remember so. that. You and you're just being a beard polite. then. I'm not recognizing you That's right. Yeah. That's yeah. right. That's sure, right. That's Otherwise, you would remember it. Yes. yes, that's right. But it's good to have you on as well. And uh, for those that aren't familiar as much with Midwestern or with your work, can you just bring us up to speed on that? Sure. As you mentioned, my name is Jason Allen. I serve as president at Midwestern Seminary, Spurgeon College, or undergraduate school uh, in Kansas City. I'm in my 10th year. And uh, it's been an incredible 10 years. God's been really kind. Uh, we went from about 1,000 students. This year we'll finish with about 5,000 students. Uh, he's blessed us on the financial front, given us a first-class faculty, first-class facilities. So it's a unique story. And I, I share it not simply because I'm grateful for what God's done there, but because I think in evangelicalism, in our corner of conservative evangelicalism, uh, we hear a lot of bad news, we don't hear enough good news. We hear about churches declining, organizations declining, fracturing, institutions declining, closing. But there's some good stories out there, and Midwestern is one of those good news stories. And uh, God has been really, really kind. At the very heart of that has been our For the Church vision, that the institution would commit our very best energies and efforts towards serving the local church. And then intersecting with perhaps conversation today, as we many years ago also declared that, that look, to be for the church doesn't merely mean for the church domestic, it means yeah. for the church international. Yeah. And so to see that vision really metastasize and spread over the globe has been really sweet. Uh, so much so, uh, just a few weeks ago, I had our registrar pull uh, just a listing of like, where are our students now? Not graduates, but current students. And we now have students from all 50 states and from over 60 countries. Wow. And I knew the last time I checked, we were like 40 some odd states and dozens of countries, but both of those have continued to expand. And I'll tell you, the list of countries was really amazing. Uh, I'll give you 64 countries here, but, uh, but countries like Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, uh, North Korea, Pakistan, Afghanistan. I mean, so hotbed. all the easy countries. All the been. easy right. countries okay. where we are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. No, and, and of course there were some easy countries there as well, <laughs> and, and predictable countries. But but honestly, I I, I didn't realize we had a student or, or more than one. Literally North Korea. I mean, literally. You know, I knew we had the Pakistan and Afghanistan, but that's incredible. But some incredible things happening, and so that's really an encouraging point, not just for me, but hopefully for your, your listeners today. Yeah, I know. Even for me personally, sitting in some of the doctoral classes and having students in the classroom with me from South Korea and from different countries in Africa. I mean, it makes for a really rich learning environment, as well as professors. I think who just live and breathe uh, missions and are about the church. So. I realize that's a free commercial, but I've experienced it personally. Yeah, no, we, we love Midwestern, and it feels like there's a heart for missions, and we want to talk about that. Now, Paul, you were just on stage talking to Mark Dever a little bit about ABWE, yes. and so you can reintroduce yourself, and then I know you want to talk a little bit about the relationship between the seminary and the academy and also the mission field. Yeah, yeah we, we had a, a good time talking with Mark about who ABWE is and really our heartbeat, which is to serve the local church, to send mission missionaries well to reach to help the local church reach the world for Christ right and uh, and, and that really leads into what I wanted to talk about because I've been a pastor for 25 years so I've served on a pastoral team um, working with a missions team been to seminary and uh, I'm interested in and maybe Jason if you would just share like how do local churches work with seminaries and missions organizations to equip and train the next generation of missionaries. Right, so, so let me try to connect some lines uh, for us. I think of and believe that the church and the seminary first you know, has and must have a, a symbiotic relationship. So if someone were to say to me fundamentally, um, you know, we wish you had stronger incoming students. Well, I would say, well, we receive the students the church has sent us, right? So, yeah. so any deficiency in the incoming students we have to make up for it in three or four years or whatever the course of study is reflective of what they did or didn't get in their family, yeah, in, right. their, in their local church and their kid and whatnot. So right. we receive those who they sent. 
And we do our very best to point them theologically, ministerially, spiritually, the full panoply, the full array of, of, of instruction and training and equipment, and then to send them back to the church, okay? To church is. Then you think about, okay, what does that have to say about missions and missionaries? Well, part of that is a specific track and degree programs for missionaries, um, if, as one feels like they have a sense of calling overseas. But even if one doesn't feel a particular sense of overseas calling, let's say while they're doing their MDiv degree, ultimately we're going to train them in such a way that wherever God moves them, they have the basic toolkit to accomplish what God has called them to do. Furthermore, so when is the missionary's work done? That's a good question, right? So, and, and there, that's a debated question, like, is there a right. certain percentage of the population that's yeah, reached yeah. or not reached? Well, one way of answering that question, and I think, and perhaps the most urgent way of answering it, when you look at any local community, is there a healthy church there established to such a degree that that missionary were to be removed out of that church and sent to another village or another city, that that church itself will be self-sustaining. Mm -hmm. The believers there are strong enough, spiritually formed enough to be to be self-sustaining in themselves in that area, that community. So what does that mean? That's it for the church vision. Mm -hmm. The missionary there is not just making uh, converts or even disciples in a generic indiscriminate sense. Yes, that's central to the work, but also want to see healthy churches established and organized so that those churches are sustaining. Those believers are equipped then to reach their community. And so whether or not there is a Western or American missionary there, hopefully at the period of time, that church will be self-sustaining without that, that presence there long-term. And we've seen with fields that have healthy theological education, I'm thinking a field like Columbia, where we sent missionaries into Columbia, they did church planting, raised up a seminary there locally. Those churches utilized that seminary and it not only creates self-sustaining churches, but it creates replicating yeah, churches, yeah. right? Yeah. Churches that can reproduce each other. And there's a there's a close relationship between, and I, again, I'm using that field, Columbia. We have a close relationship between the churches and the seminaries and what they're going to be doing missionally afterwards. How do we foster that in the States? Like in an, our North American context, how do we build better relationships with seminaries and uh, and missional organizations that help men and women do what they're going to do after seminary? Yeah, I think first thing you have to talk about it, and that, look, that's no small thing because there's a lot we can talk about these days. You can talk about cultural issues, political issues, you know, kind of local church scuttlebutt. Let's talk about political issues. Right, right. <laughs> no, I mean, just, uh, there are a lot of voices, right? We live in a loquacious age, a lot yes. of noise, a lot of conversations. And so, but to make sure that, that in your community, if that's institution, local church, you know, Midwestern Seminary, there's a clear voice and voices continuing to go back to the Great Commission and the international work God is doing. Then I say you have to get your students and your community actual exposure overseas, okay? So we're very hard to provide at different touch points throughout the year, different strategic time periods, overseas trips, and not just like, you know, the mission trip to Cancun. Right. But 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 to actually where they're they're doing work that that, to, that that's, that's engaging and requires a commitment and they're seeing God do things there. So it's not just about the tourism but the actual work. And then as you have and we have these relationships overseas. There's oftentimes benefit to being an ongoing, okay, we have a relationship with these eight places or these 12 countries or, or these 16 missionaries that we're going to repeatedly go to to strengthen their hand. They're going to know we're coming. They're going to invest in us. And so we're wetting that appetite. And then additionally, I would say creating a context through institutional support and resourcing and also kind of cultural expectation to where not just you're creating mission trips for students to go, but your faculty and staff can go. And so like we have many of our faculty that go overseas annually, some, some go more than once a year because they are teaching people who will train pastors in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America, in Southeast Asia, places we go to. And so I think it's that conduit, that conversation, and then that resourcing it to actually make it happen. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. How do you continue to create a, when you, you have a culture, I think you even came in with some culture of missions emphasis at Midwestern. How do you continue to foster that in a way that allows missionaries to go up, but also when pastors come into churches, they're coming in with that kind of mentality of thinking about the nations. Yeah, so I think there are, on the one hand, things that we do that are institution specific. We have a, a very robust missions program, that will get to the weeds here, the podcast, but it's called Fusion. Uh, it's a, a traditionally for us been an undergraduate program. We have built it out to be at the master's level as well. We have significant donor support. And so to where students get to go overseas for like a 10 to 12 week 
full three months yeah. service in the summer, and then their training the year before and year after is building up towards that. So for instance, uh, this summer we'll have students in South Asia, Africa, uh, the Middle East, Turkey, different places, and these are all like, again, these are real ministry places. Yeah. This is not, again, the mission trip, you know, the, the student right. ministry, right. mission trip in Cancun. These are, these are ministry hard to places. Right. I'll be there. I'm going overseas uh, just a few weeks to go, and we get to the summer, uh, late spring, to, to be on the ground with our some of our teams there in the, in the Middle East region and to encourage them and encourage our missionaries there more broadly. And so part of it is even me, candidly, leading out in that through my own travel patterns and say, okay, I'm going to prioritize going overseas once or twice a year to not just serve and strengthen and encourage, but to hopefully signal, you know, this is such a priority that I got five kids, full life, institution, but I'm going to go once or twice a year to actually be there and strengthen the work of those missionaries and of our students. That's great. That's great. What obstacles have you faced in setting that stage, though? Because I think there is a setting that example, because there's a temptation and a tendency that we do want to build empires. Yeah. We do want to build brands. We do want to build kingdom, kingdoms and institutions, and you lead an institution. So how can a Christian leader, whether you're leading something big or something very little, how can you avoid that temptation to sort of just hunker down, you know, build your own brand and reputation and be constantly outward focused like that? Because I think that's probably a little bit uncommon among Christian leaders. Well, I, you know, I would say, first of all, the Holy Great Commission isn't a distraction from our mission, it is our mission, mm, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, and again, even for us, institutionally specific for the church is our vision, and that's an international work. And yeah. so I rejoice to see healthy churches, whether in suburban Kansas City or Mumbai or Seoul or wherever. The next thing I would say is, um, you know, for, 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 for us and for me, the, the competition is not, I can go overseas or I can, you know, whatever, build my empire was a phrase you use. Really the competition is for me, I'm a radar guy. And, and most people who have full lives are radar men and women, meaning it, you live with a certain radar of things you have to do and you must do. And so people look at an institutional leader like myself as a senior president think, must be great to be president. You have all this flexibility. No, actually, you have like no flexibility. It's the opposite because your days are so often pre-committed before it, the, the sun even comes up, and your weeks are pre-committed for the next year starts. And so, and the radar guy in me says, okay, "Here's what I got to do this year. Here's what we have to accomplish. Here are the priorities." And 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 it may not be that Turkey is ever on that radar. Yeah. It may not be that Indonesia is ever on that radar. If I don't make myself think beyond the radar of events and commitments I have and think globally, what should be on my radar? Yeah. So international travel for me, look, it's not glamorous. I'm six foot seven. I'm not flying first class. You know, so there, there's an inconvenience to it. Getting there is unpleasant. Uh, I, I don't dietarily. I, I, I get some funny ways. So like the cuisine is usually not good to me overseas. Other things practically, logistically are complicated. And I'm always like two days out, what was I thinking when I scheduled this trip two years ago? But then when I'm there, I'm always like, I am so glad I'm here. I am so glad I went when I get back. And so to make myself think beyond the, the urgent and to uh, you know, bring in the important into that radar and then just kind of lock it in and go. And so for me, that's looked like ideally rhythmically for me about two times internationally a year. Usually kind of once going east, once going west. Okay. Because I think so many people in ministry make this mistake of they have to-do lists, they have next action lists, they don't schedule their priorities. Yeah. And, and if they do, they're scheduling them for a day or for a week, not six, eight, nine months or a year or two out in advance. Mm -hmm. And if missions is going to be a priority, you have to schedule it in advance in some way because it's never going to organically it's come never up. never going to be convenient. In the course of your day, right. it's never going to be yeah. convenient. Yeah. Right, and it's, you know, for me, uh, it, it, you know, obviously I'm Southern Baptist, service Southern Baptist context, rejoice in what you guys do. See, ABW is, is not just ministry college, ministry friends, and yeah. there's a synergy here. Uh, my work primarily day to day is, is with the IMB, and, which is the Southern Baptist Missionary Agency, that, which you guys know and partner with as yeah. well. Yeah. Um, so for me, I, I do feel a certain responsibility beyond Midwestern and the Great Commission to, to also just kind of serve my denomination by showing up to encourage those missionaries. And so what I do, I mean, I, I literally sent this email yesterday, not to pat myself on the back, literally yesterday, where I know where I'll be regionally, and again, I'm not trying to be too specific here to some sensitivities there, but emailed other missionary leaders and said, hey, I'll be there, I will have discretionary time, let me know how best to encourage and strengthen the encourage the workers and strengthen the work taking place here and here these dates in May. And so you you, you kind of begin to fill that out and, and let folks increasingly know where you'll be. And then uh, I have found again, I go to, to encourage, I leave encouraged, I go to you know strengthen their work, I leave my work next 
Well, thanks for serving us. I'm a Southern Baptist pastor, so you can say yeah, that's what we're doing right now. So that's right. That's what right. are some of the things you're working on academically? I know you're doing some writing. You've been kind of going deep into Spurgeon on some different areas. Can you give us a glimpse into some of the research you're doing right now? Sure. Yeah, I have a book coming out later this year called Turnaround: uh, The Remarkable Story of Institutional Transformation and the Ten principles that, that made it happen. And so it, it's basically telling the Midwestern Center story, yeah. getting it back to kind of the good news piece. Yeah. And then again, just like, man, what God's done and, and, and why and how we believe he's done it. So it's not a, it's certainly not a victory tour on my part. It's not my personal memoirs. It's not. It, it's a story of mm -hmm. of what we as a team have experienced and what we believe God has done. And so yeah. to tell that story, I do think there are principles there, practices that, that, that plug well into most any Christian endeavor, family, institution, mm -hmm. mission agency, churches, um, and some of it is kind of sanctified common sense, some yeah. of it is, is I think deeply, richly, robustly biblical spiritual, and uh, kind of everywhere in between. So that's going on. Um, I have um, ongoing Spurgeon work we talked about, a couple other things, the other book I'm preaching, I'm supposed to be getting a manuscript in here pretty soon. So it's always something, and again, my, I. I'm kind of a goal-oriented, task-oriented guy, so I, I do think there's a, a, a helpfulness to Midwestern Seminary for me to be writing something coming out kind of annually, yeah. so that's basically what I'm targeting. Fun. Very good. Well, thank you for being on, both of you. Yeah. Appreciate it. Paul, any final words as well? Yeah. I just want to thank you for doing a great job with Midwestern. Oh, You're cool. blessing uh, folks that are being a blessing to us, and however we can serve you, we want to be a part of what God's doing there as we train up a, a, a new generation of spiritual leaders and, and missionaries. Yeah. I do so. think, if I could have just one final moment here, I, I do think that we are at a moment generationally where we need evangelicalism to, to bring a renewed focus on missions. And um, you know, we had kind of 20 years ago, Piper saying, don't waste your life. Kind of right. 10, 15 years ago, David Platt saying, um, do radical things. I feel like there's even, a little bit of a, a lack of a prophetic voice in the season, mm -hmm. which COVID has done been very disruptive. So I'm praying in this new decade that we're now in that, that, that there would be not just a across the board sense of we need to do more, but even God raise up some new generation of prophetic voices mm -hmm. to, to really bring yeah. urgency there. So mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you for the time today. Yeah, thank you for the program. Appreciate you again. Thank you for that. And we will continue to bring you content from Together for the Gospel in Louisville, Kentucky. Until next time, the Missions Podcast is a ministry of ABWE, and we will see you in our next episode. Thanks for watching and listening.